Welcome. We be live on the air, I think, but I don't see us. Oh, well, so Donna, Donna, hi, Donna. Donna's watching. Okay, so uh, we are here. We, I am Aaron Freeman. Uh, this is the Peggy Mason. We are the Chicago Brain Buddies, brought to you by the Chicago Society for Neuroscience at chicagosfn.org. I love you, Peggy. <laughs> I love you, too. <laughs> so uh, we are what going to... What are we to, talking about, Aaron? Well, I got to tell you, you know, we're going to talk about the most important aspects of biology. Okay, what is it? When when, when, when we're talking biology, we are talking genes, DNA, those four little base pairs, those four little base pairs where they run through the... the, (laughs) What? Look, wait, 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 look, biology is it. It, I mean, look, I look the way I look because of the way my parents' genes bind together, bound together. Genetics. you think all this neurobiology... But and you're wait, on wait, to wait, genes? My brain is a function of genetics. The, and that's the, it? Well, I mean, that's how that's how it, that's the instructions. You can't have you can't have uh, you can't drive a car unless you know how to drive it. You have to look at the instruction book. What? It's genes. Okay. Genes. Genes. Genes are important. Yes, they read the I'll genes. I'll give you that. They're crucial. Without genes, with without genes, our cells wouldn't know what to do. Without no gene, genes, no protein. With genes, our our cells are not sufficient. Genes alone do not do this. So there's a recent the paper most, what, that is so exciting because it really highlights the limitation of genetics. What do you mean? Um, and and what they did was they did a really big change for mice. Okay, for lab mice. They have mice that are studied the way we all we scientists typically study mice which is in a lab laboratory environment they have these little cages there's not a whole lot going on we give them food they don't have to find food there's every once in a while somebody does an enriched environment but in general there's not a whole lot going on temperature is comfortable for us we have a daylight day night cycle that's comfortable for us we work with them when it's comfortable for us etc etc it's an and, unnatural environment. And so um, a couple of people have now compared those mice to mice that are in very big groups, like in a big area. This, this woman, Andrea Graham at Princeton, made a many meters by many meters area where she has the, the mice are out in the open. They're subject to weather. It rains on the mice, okay? <laughs> you know, they have, things happen. There's there's food scattered around, but they have to go around to various food stations right. to find food. And um, and what she sees is completely different from what you would see in in the lab or what she did see in the lab. And that is just, you, you, mean, you know, you I've mean, always you... known I'm not a big, I'm not a big, um, I've always railed against genes as everything, but this these things are things that I thought genes did do. Okay, and for example, for example, on for their example. own. But for example, what what, what kind of revelation? Okay, so the example that that Andrea Graham looked at was she looked at these mice that are nematode resistant and nematode susceptible. What's a nematode? A nematode is a little worm. It's a C. elegans. You might have heard of it. It's one of our popular. Um, model model organisms. One of the rock and, star worms. Um, it it also is a it lives in other animals, including mice and humans. Humans, dogs, right. whatever. Right. So, um, she, what she did was she took these animals that are nematode resistant, nematode susceptible. She put them outside in her in her enclosure, and. After some amount of time, she she goes out and she measures how many nematodes these different mice have. Yeah. They have the same amount of nematodes. <laughs> they both are chock full of nematodes. So the nematode resistant, resistant not so much. That's so amazing. The, let me understand. So in the lab, they are these these mice are nematode resistant, and then and then they're genetically. They're, 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 they have evolved over billions of years the genes necessary to flush out these 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 uh, nematodes. Well, I, I don't know whether they evolved or they were bred or they were engineered. Well, I have no idea how we got them, but, but the supposedly nematode resistant in the lab. 
the end of the lab, right. outside, and the nematodes are perfectly happy to load up inside of these mice. That's, you know, that's really amazing because we talk about it as though, say, bacteria have a <clears throat> an antibiotic resistant gene, as though that is a thing. And what this suggests is that at least for nematode resistance, it's not a thing. It's a mixture of a gene and a particular environment. In the laboratory environment, this mouse is nematode resistant. In a more eth ethological, ecologically normal environment, it's not resistant to nematodes at all. Well, you know, by the way, I want to say a thank you, say hi to Lilith and to Donna, and uh, we want to say if you guys have a question for Peggy, you, we'd like about if you read about these uh, the country mice and the lab mice, uh, and I have a comment on that, please leave uh, write it down there, comment, and we'd love to see you. Uh, but yes, so the uh, uh, these worms really and, and so, oh, so one of the things that I thought was interesting about it, my first thought when I first kind of looked at the uh, uh, the paper. Was that I, as I was before I finished it, I was thinking, wow, well, what a healthy intestinal microbiome these mice are going to have. They're going to have lots of, of microbial diversity, which I have always, I've thought of recently since I just heard of the, the microbial the microbiome. I thought, well, that's great. They're going to have microbial uh, biological diversity. Oh, wait, uh, uh, what? Eth ethological. Uh, yeah, ethological. Um, yeah, e ethological just is uh you know what ecological ecological it means the environment the plants the weather the animals around and ethological is more uh focused on the animal environment but they're both terms to just say uh what we what happens out in the in, under natural circumstances who do we see around us what do we encounter on a daily basis? That's those are ecologically complex and ethologically complex, um, which the lab environment is not. So, um, yeah. but, but these, back to my, microbial diversity. I mean, yes, they had, their gut microbiome was diverse. They had much more diversity than than those lab rats. That should be good. Uh, I don't, but I don't know that it's not good. Right. There's nothing to say that these animals were dying because they had a lot of nematodes. They had a lot of nematodes, but that they, at least in this article, I, it wasn't clear that that was a bad thing. It could have just been a thing. You know, yeah. you and I, or a third of the world's population is, is infected with toxo, toxoplasmosis. Now, and yet a very small number of those, uh, those infected with toxo have known symptoms that develop because of that infection most of us are what we would call asymptomatic it doesn't right. matter it's, it's it can be a problem with uh, pregnant women uh to be around uh, it's, it's definitely the problem with problem pregnant, women, pregnant but, women but um but for, but most of, yeah. for the most of us it's a it's an unimportant infection and so i don't know that this infection of the nematodes is is a problem in the wild, maybe it's not a problem because they have microbial, you know, they have a diverse microbiome. Right. We don't know. Right. They said it, it, could be, don't know. it could be that the nematodes feasted on that more diverse microbiome. What's that? It could be that the nematodes feasted on those those, those diverse uh, microbes. That may be. Yeah. That may be. Now, let's yeah. see here. There's a, just, uh, Lilith has a question here. Uh, referred to the gene as important in the survival of the, of the pseudo in the pseudo wild survival behaviors that are inherited. Oh, uh, yeah. This so this really wasn't about their behavior. So this particular experiment wasn't about the behavior of the mice. There, I, I mean, so there was there's one interesting study that talked about behavior, and that was um, in in lab rodents. And I think this is mice and rats. You have to really pack in sugar before you see any adverse consequences. Okay. Okay. So you have to feed these animals so much sugar that it's it is nothing that you or I would ever, even on our most depressed days, <laughs> uh, come close to eating. You, you wouldn't drink um, that much uh, high, high fructose corn syrup pop or anything. Yeah. So, but. What in what Wayne Potts uh, did, and he has this barn environment, 
what he did was he found he gave these mice um a moderately sugary diet that is is very much on a par with what we we do eat we modern humans do eat and what he found was um that the 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 females died at a at two times the rate when they were fed sure, this moderate amount of sugar versus control and the males compared to control they won the the these this barn environment that Potts has has different territories that are separated by sort of pseudo boundaries but they can cross the boundaries and they fight over the various territories because some of them are are better than others and the males that had been fed this sugar didn't win the territories at, you know one less of the time at a, at a lower rate than the control males and they also um had a quarter fewer offspring than control males but so these are these are the consequences that are um both behavioral and very significant for from an evolutionary point of view and so that again in the lab rats in the artificial environment there the, the sugar didn't appear to have any particular impact not a, a much much higher dose had no impact that was higher than, right but then so when you got that's out, a really you know that's a really interesting another really interesting um result but so of course the really i think the, uh, among the most profound implications of this work is that it calls into question our certainty about the results that we get as a result of error, uh, as a result of working with lab mice yeah it, it really does it 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 suggests that these conclusions that we're coming to for um the function of genes which is always going to be you, you know how i you, you know aaron you and i always get into this thing where we talk about the function of a area of the brain right and right. reductionism like you're that, always cursing my reduction like to, to summarize that in a couple sentences and i'm <laughs> usually not as comfortable with that because you know things um and th but the same thing goes with genes people want to say this gene does this you know what the gene actually does is that it can code for a protein if you know the, if the stars align and and it's expressed <laughs> it might code for this protein but then that protein might get spliced and then it might get edited rna edited and then it might get translate post translationally modified and and who knows what comes out on the other end and for that reason right. um you, you know a gene doesn't have a, a, a function it just doesn't and and this is really showing us that in an in your face kind of way i thought another one that was really um interesting was uh you know there are these genes that that code for very similar proteins so for example Hox A1 and Hox B1, well, their names are similar and they code for similar things. So that in a lab rat, these are gene, Hox A1 and B1 are genes. They're genes and they're in, involved in, in development and developmentally patterning, say, the, the hind brain and, and so on. So the um, so if you knock out Hox A1 in, in the lab environment, Hox B1 appears to say, okay, I'll take over all, all is well and you see no difference same thing if you knock out hox b1 it appears that hox a1 says no problem i can compensate and no different you see no difference in the in the mouse but if you do this and you put them out in the barn the, there is more than 30 percent uh lethality with a with either knocking out a or b that's really amazing. So you say Hox A1 can compensate for Hox B1. Well, yeah, in in the lab, only in the lab. Well, and so, that's uh, that's powerful. Well, obviously, the solution is that you got to take those mice and, rat and rats out of the lab. Forget it. The lab thing is just is, the lab thing is dead. The lab is gone, and you, you got to take you make a a, a a a mouse habitat somewhere in Garfield Park out there by the University of Chicago. And, right. And so, you... so is that the answer? Of and, course it is. Um, Obviously, <laughs> for a few reasons, 
that's on, for a couple reasons it's unlikely to happen and for one reason it's probably not a great idea for it to happen so the reasons that um it won't happen are that in this in a room where you could house a thousand mice in the traditional way you could house 40 mice in this so you know unless somebody wants to say okay universities you can now expand by an uh, oh more than a mo an order of magnitude more than 10 times this is not going to happen well also it would make uh, having the mice run around might make it more time consuming to cult to get them and to be able to mess around with them well that there's that too and the the wild mice are not as they're not as domesticated they're not as chill so they're a lot harder <laughs> to handle and it's not going to be as pleasant you know i handle i ha handle lab rats all day they're the most they're the sweetest animals in the world um but if i got a wild rat it would fight me you know and then it would make my doing my experiments much much more difficult but let me just say, what what does science care? What does the real science world care about how difficult your experiment is? If it takes, if it's a difficult experiment, you need to get the right results to get accurate. So, Who cares? And, and so there's there's one more difference that that or one more important uh, factor here, which is that these barn and and these large enclosure experiments, they can really they can't really keep a lot of factors constant. So what you're doing is you're looking at the whole animal, right? So the what's going to what's going to happen for the whole animal? Is that whole animal going to survive? How is it going to behave? But you can't look at mechanism. So if you want to look at mechanism, you've got to go to a controlled environment. It's just I mean, I don't think it's a matter of we need to do one and not the other. I think we need to do both. We need to have hu some humility. We need to um, understand that these are complementary approaches and that both are needed and both are going to tell us different things. Well, though, this goes to, to Nana's question, who wants to know what are the implications for research outcomes uh, uh, with, with, the, with, the, um, with these mice? What are the implications I mean, for I, research? I, I think that's the, the implication is to have humility. Ah. To say, in this lab environment, this is what we see. It would be lovely if we could, if somebody would check this important phenotype out in the in a more um, robust environment, a, a barn or a, a large enclosure of some type. Um, but but then when we go back and we look at how it's working, we are going to go reductionist, and we are going to to uh, change our the factors that we're. Uh, that we're looking at and we're going to keep some constant and we're going to go back into the lab environment to do that. Well, I'm glad to hear that you're not completely anti-reductionist. Okay. I'm glad to hear just a little, every now and then you'll shrink them down to its components. But so does this, as, as, as you read this, because we're doing this, this particular topic because you read it and you were excited about it. Does it have any implications for how you will go forward with your work? Well, for my work, I have always, always wanted to test wild rats. I would love to test wild rats. Um, you know, I just don't, I don't particularly know how to do that. Uh, um, but again, it's like huge, um, tremendously more, much more work. Yeah. So I've always thought that wild rats would be... So when in our paradigm, for those of you that may not know... You know, we have a trapped rat and and there's a free rat that can come in and open a door for the trapped rat. Now, the door is truly sort of the only way in. It's kind of obvious if you or I look at the setup. Oh, there's the door. But this is a very difficult task for a lab rat. And so it takes them between, say, three and six days to figure it out. Now, I have always thought that the the wild rat would come in there and immediately figure it out. <laughs> right. So they are just, they're used to working in the world and affecting the world and making physical things happen. Because and so yeah, they just would have no wild. problem with that. Right. Out, out in the wild, they have to navigate novel uh, ter terrains, 
shifting terrains. They have to adapt to learn what to do when it rains, when it gets cold, how to protect themselves. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so, so I would get away from having to worry about that, which I don't really want to worry about. I'm not that interested in the motor learning piece of it. I'm more interested in the, I care about you or I don't care about you piece of it. And I would love to know, okay, the, the rat can do this. I'm assuming a wild rat can do this. I could put some food in there and I'm pretty sure that they would do it pronto. Now, would they do it for a, for a trapped rat? of whatever type. And that's, you know, that's an, it's an experiment I would love to do, but, um, but it's just, it's very, very difficult. I I can get, I can get a little bit closer to it by say, um, raising lab rats in a very enriched environment where they have a lot of opportunity to uh, interact with, with toys and, and make things move and doors and, and a lot of different animals, et cetera. And so just enrich their environment from the fairly impoverished environment that, that is typical. So have you, is that something you could do? You could, yeah, actually... I could do that. Oh, okay. Well, but again, I think that the, somebody the... wants to give me the money. I'll do it tomorrow. <laughs> All right. So I, I, out there, here, there, there it is. Peggy Mason is going to, will do a brand new experiment with your name on it. Uh, okay. Yeah, absolutely. I'll put your name on it. <laughs> called the Lilith Anderson experiment. <laughs> the Anderson experiment. All right. But again, I think the the big takeaway from this is uh, humility. It's just we said several times that yeah. we, we learn these people like you do these wonderful experiments in labs, but we don't want to take those the results of those experiments as necessarily being the last word. That's right. That's right. And what you know, what you want is something that is true in in every environment, right? And so this is a, this is disappointing, um, but it's real. It's so real. We have to we have to face it, and we have to acknowledge it. Well, what I face acknowledge is the fact that you are magnificent. And you are my friend, and we are delighted to be able to. I'm delighded to be able to talk to you every Thursday. We want to thank uh, Donna and Lilith, and the folks who are watching, who will be watching later on. And so I mean, we, Lilith, Lilith, or Luani. Luani, Luani. Which one Luani, is it? By the way, the, the, are you going to tell us now? You're on. You're on, Lilith. Are you Lilith or are you Luani? Let's see here. Can we get? Uh, I don't even know. I might be able to know. I don't know. Let's see. Little what, 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 however you would like to be called, you yeah. are our friend, and we love you. That's true. And, and Lilith and, and Lil Luani did a wonderful translation and reading of my poem, Invited Physicist Luani. Okay. Uh, Luani did Luani a, it is. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I loved that. I thought that was so wonderful. I did a poem uh, years ago for NPR called Invited Physicist to Your Funeral, and Luani not only translated it into Spanish, but beautifully read it it's on you it's on facebook you, uh, aaron do you understand spanish uh, uh a little bit i mean well enough that i understood that I, mean, I, that I don't understand i don't understand spanish and i was just listening to lonnie yeah. and i just found her voice to be so beautiful and um and expressive and i got the i got the point without understanding a single i wasn't trying but i didn't un- understand a single word the woman got the right stuff. You know what I'm saying? The woman. Yeah, and it's a great right poem. It, it's a great poem, Aaron. All right. Well, thank you very much, Peggy Mason. We will see you next week. We hope we see you guys next week. And we love you very much. We are the Chicago Brain Buddies, brought to you by the Chicago Society for Neuroscience. And bye, y'all. Talk to you soon. Bye. <laughs>